Okay, next speaker is myself. So let me share screen. Okay. Um, okay. I'm Shotaro Yamazaki, and uh, um, I'm also presenting some um, advertising my work. Uh, this is uh, work on uh, actually magneta flares. So this uh, afternoon session we have uh, so many um, kind of topics about. Uh, FRB, especially from Magneto. So what I'm going to talk about now is not really about FRB, but rather a more kind of fundamental um, issue about Magneto field. Okay, these are collaborators. Okay, so let me raise a question first. So uh, this figure shows the um, typical Magneto flare spectrum in X-ray to gamma ray. And you can see here uh, observation as a, de a dot, and also you can see the uh, theoretical line here. And uh, you see a uh, huge inconsistency of uh, a few tens of KED. And this discrepancy uh, remains a kind of long standing problem uh, since the discovery of magnetic flare. And actually, this uh, theory, theory line just assumes a thermal uh, kind of thermal uh, emission. And uh, because of this discrepancy, we can't measure accurately the temperature of the uh, plasma, and also the size. We can't estimate the size of the emitting region. So this kind of uh, problem remained for a long time. So here we uh, consider this. We address this question by considering a, a special process, a resonant cyclotron scattering, also uh, introduced in uh, Kunishito's talk as well. And uh, this, uh, of course, magnet flare is highly kind of interesting because it is discussed to be uh, kind of related to fast radio burst. Okay, uh, actually no one explained what is magnetar because it's kind of common knowledge, but magnetar is uh, uh, some neutron star population which has the highest magnetic field among this population. And uh, you see that our uh, typical magnetic field is up to 10 to the 15 gas. And actually that it is different, differently discovered uh, by observation. So magnetar is observed um, first discovered by the X-ray or gamma ray flare as a transient. But uh, most radio pulsar, which has smaller magnetic field, it is discovered by the radio survey by pulsation. So this is completely different way of discovery. And this is the typical um, kind of property of the magnetar flare. So normally magnetar is neutron star, hot neutron star. So the surface luminosity is already very high. So it is about 10 to the 35 L per second. Now, however, when it bursts, then uh, the distribution is uh, shown like this. So it is typically uh, starting from the 10 to the 38 or 39 L per second, and it continues up to 10 to the 47 L per second. So this is the highest energy. And this luminosity continues, continues over huge range uh, in terms of luminosity. And uh, we see most common, common bursts uh, which is called the short burst uh, uh, here. This is the most faintest population, but it's very common. So we see often this kind of burst with very short duration, less than one second. And actually this is, yeah, actually we see uh, not this kind of flare, but we also see this type of peculiar flare from the galactic magnetar in association with fast radio burst. So this study, this kind of study is kind of very important. So this is again already introduced by Kunishito, but a uh, typical um, classical model for this kind of magnetar flare is a thermal emission from the trapped fireball. I skip the explanation because it's already introduced, but this is uh, just a kind of, um, kind of plasma uh, coupled with uh, radiation. And it is highly dense, and uh, any radiation coming out from the surface is already thermalized. So we only see thermal X-ray to gamma ray emission. Um, so this is the, uh, this is what we see uh, as a uh, magnetar flare. This is a naive understanding. However, still we see, uh, after this consideration, we still see some inconsistency here. So this is the motivation. So let me explain uh, what is this uh, process, resonance cyclotron scattering, uh, we consider here. So please imagine our uh, one electron uh, moving inside a magnetosphere, so near the neutron star. Um, because the magnetic field strength is very high, so the cycle, um, it is uh, originally have a gyro motion, but this gyro motion quickly disappeared because the synchrotron cooling time scale is so high, so fast. So it is just a kind of moving only along the magnetic field, and uh, it doesn't have a momentum 
are in perpendicular direction to the magnetic field. However, when this electron is encountered with uh, some radiation, which has typical energy, uh, which depends on the magnetic field, this is called cyclotron energy. This is proportional to the magnetic field strength. So when this uh, photon with specific energy hit this electron, this electron absorbs this emission, and uh, it, uh, it has a uh, one uh, from ground state to the one uh, higher uh, Randall state. And then this state quickly go back to the ground state. In this way, it emits uh, the same energy uh, photon in random direction. Um, in addition, we also have a Doppler effect because the electron is not in the rest. It is moving possibly with relativistic velocity. So this kind of procedure is important inside the magnetosphere. Why? Well, this is very simple because uh, inside the magnetosphere, uh, magnetic field is typically dipole, so B is proportional to R to the minus 3, and uh, this is a typical scaling. So this cyclotron fre um, frequency, cyclotron energy, is about uh, 1 MeV uh, at the neutron star surface. However, it eventually, uh, if you go faster from the neutron star, at about 10 times neutron star radii, 100 km, then this energy becomes equal to the emission coming from the fireball surface, which is about 10 keV. So this is simple scaling relation. So this kind of effect will completely uh, change the original emission feature. So you see scattering layer. There is always a scattering layer inside typical magnetosphere. This is the uh, why we consider this effect. This is very important. Then uh, let's look at more carefully. So uh, if we include the Doppler effect, because here I show the uh, uh, schematic configuration. So we prepare fireball uh, on the neutron star surface when burst happens. Then photon coming from this fireball is uh, at least once scattered by an uh, electron um, by this process, resonance cyclotron scattering process. And uh, this electron has some velocity field. It is not in a rest, moving. However, we don't know this uh, velocity. So this is the problem. So we know the geometry of the magnetic field on a large scale. This is dipole. So we need to know the velocity field. So we determine the velocity field by a simple consideration. Actually, uh, because uh, fireball emission is very, very high luminosity, super Eddington emission. So therefore, this uh, exerts strong force on the electron. So this is the picture uh, in a schematic picture again, uh, in the rest frame of the electron, where electron is not moving. And the electron is always seeing this radiation in perpendicular direction to the radiation force. Otherwise, it quickly accelerated, and also it could be quickly decelerated. So this kind of a, um, uh, this is kind of a um, steady state. So in any way, electron achieve this configuration inside the magnetosphere. So this uh, direct uh, kind of conclusion, the direct consequence is electron uh, is uh, moving with the velocity depending on the angle. Uh, uh, some, some, it has uh, some specific uh, angular dependence, and uh, this velocity is not super high, uh, mildly relativistic. So we now know the velocity distribution of the electron inside the magnetosphere. Okay, so let's, then, let's make a toy model how this kind of uh, modification of spectrum happens. So we consider a uh, toy model. Uh, you can see at the center, of these axes, there is a fireball. It is assumed to be a point source, and this fireball has um, thermal emission, thermal spectrum. And then we consider a, a dipole field, and also we know we prepare electron there, and this electron uh, has velocity depending on the angle. So the main parameter we inject is the uh, original temperature of the fireball. So this is a thermal emission spectrum. And this temperature is the main parameter. And by using Monte Carlo simulation, so prepare so many photons according to this uh, spectrum, then we can calculate for each photon uh, which energy they attain after this process. And we consider very simple assumption. Uh, any photon experiences one time scattering. It could be multi maybe experience multiple scattering, but for the first step to understand this kind of process, we consider uh, only one time scattering with 100% probability. So let's see the result. So this is the original spectrum. So this is just a thermal spectrum in F nu. 
and we assume just 10 keV black body. And then after this scattering, this is modified slightly. Uh, you can see actually the some kind of hardening, spectral hardening here. And then also we check the directional dependence. So because observer is not always looking at this in specific direction. But you can see um, there is not so much uh, dependence on the direction. So we consider the angle averaged emission is the uh, typical result. Then uh, we have only one parameter, effective temperature of the fireball. So this is uh, what we want to know after comparing with observation. So let's see the application. So we consider uh, this is the galactic field magnetic distribution. And uh, there is uh, also, uh, I show the center of the magnetic, uh, center of our galaxy. And uh, there is one famous magnetar. This magnetar shows a strong burst forest in the past. And uh, we pick up typical bright flare. And uh, then this is the right curve, uh, time scale versus count rate. And then we uh, check the spectrum, and this is the main result. So you can see blue line is the original spectrum, and the red line is the after the scattering. So we actually do not add any fine tuning. So this is just, a, just finding T effective temperature by feeding. So this is amazingly good feed. Actually, we can determine for the first time the temperature of the fireball with this kind of model. And also because we know rough distance to the source, so we can calculate the size of the emitting region, which is about three times neutron star radii, which is about 30 kilometer, uh, which is pretty consistent with this kind of theory. So this is a very useful tool. Actually, I have another result, uh, which is kind of still preliminary, because we want to make this kind of code public. So we uh, try to uh, implement this into x spec. Uh, it's kind of common analysis code of this kind of flare. Then this is the result for other flare. The left hand, left hand side, this is a magnetar. Uh, actually, the, this is galactic magnetar, uh, which has galactic FRB. Actually, the date of the data taken is just one day before this FRB event. So we see, again, a very good fit, um, and we can determine the temperature. So this kind of model is very useful because we have lots of data depending on the episode bursting episode, and we can see the temporal evolution. Uh, depending on the episode, we can see the increase or decrease of this kind of temperature, which would be useful for the future understanding of also the FRB and the magnet affair. Okay, thank you, I wrap up here. This is a takeaway. We have solution, we have we had a problem. We solve this problem by simple model, and it really works. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. I'm the chair, so I need, to, I need to ask for a question uh, for my talk. Uh, if any, is there any question? Uh, I want to know the relation between your work and I want to understand the relation between your work and, for example, Yuka san's talk. So you mentioned that uh, there is no very small, small so the result on the spectrum and. It, 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 it naively sounds inconsistent with his study, your study. So what, what's the difference? I mean, yeah, the main difference is maybe I can show something. Uh, the main difference is, of course, what we are talking about is completely different. So Iota-san's talk, he, he is talking about uh, magnet flare-like uh, emission uh, observed at the same time of FRB. What I'm talking about is typical magnet flare. So these two are completely different in terms of the temperature, because in his case, it's about 100 keV temperature. But in my case, this is about less than 10 keV. So we don't know why they are so different. But uh, in classical model, we only need to consider trapped fireball down the bottom of the uh, magnetosphere. I, what I'm calculating is this emission from this fireball. Uh, maybe yoka san considering the other component, wind component, non-thermal component, added by uh, outflowing uh, plasma. So this is the relation to his work. But uh, we are talking about completely different uh, kind of phenomena. Could be, but we don't know yet. So this is a matter of discussion. There are many previous uh, so research is about the temperature of the fireball by using some exponential 
uh, power law plus exponential or something like that. Yes. And uh, what is the difference of the temperature from the previous results? Yes, a good question. So actually, uh, in the traditional model, people have, observers have uh, kind of um, some empirical model with a thermal component without cutoff. And this temperature derived is slightly different. Maybe order is same, but we have a slight difference. And some models have two component black body. In this case, physical, this, uh, so this kind of model is not physical, physically motivated. But my, my model is physically motivated. Therefore, this temperature could be used as a complete study of uh, burst from the same episode. So this is the main difference. Maybe we can talk about it in the discussion. Thank you so much. Okay. Ah, sorry for the mess. Um, 